In respiratory failure, beyond understanding the types, your job is two things. Number one, manage the respiratory failure, and number two, address the underlying cause. Hi guys, and welcome to Quick Guys for Medicine. My name is Fatai, I'm a hospitalist and assistant professor working in South Carolina. On this channel, we'll talk about medicine and discuss topics around medical education. So feel free to hit the subscribe button below. I'll appreciate that very much. In this video, we'll discuss respiratory failure. There's several types of respiratory failure and how to approach it in a very practical uh, sense. So quickly, there are two types of respiratory failure. Number one, the one that you can identify from a regular pulse oximeter, whether it's on the screen or it's your, you know, your bedside small socks. You see there that there's oxygen saturation below 92% for the most part and patient is in some type of distress. It's staying there, it's not getting better. So that's one type of respiratory failure and that is hypoxic respiratory failure. Make sure to watch the video to the end because after all of this, we'll be practicing real case scenarios, so stay tuned. The other type of respiratory failure is hypercapnic respiratory failure. That one, you can't necessarily, you can't detect it from a pulse source. You have to do a blood gas to see partial pressure of CO2. And if that is in fact elevated, that is another type of respiratory failure. So one, hypoxic respiratory failure, easily detectable in a pulse oximeter. Second, hypercapnic respiratory failure that you normally would detect from a, a blood gas. There are several causes of hypoxic respiratory failure. One of the main causes of hypoxic respiratory failure is usually a ventilation perfusion mismatch where the oxygen might be getting there there's nothing to pick it up to get into the system or the oxygen is not getting to you know the area the alveola where where it will be picked up in the first place you know there are other causes of mech uh, uh you know mechanical causes of it you can say you know for example diffusion limitation and then pulmonary shunting can also be a cause of our, uh, hypoxic respiratory failure with hypercapnic respiratory failure the majority of what's happening is some defect in the mechanics you know where because of that you're having air trapping you're having co2 retention uh, uh and that basically is what causes the gets the co2 uh to go up um, your job as a clinician in these scenarios will be two things. Number one, like I said, you intervene and manage the respiratory failure. And second, you address the underlying cause of the respiratory failure. So now, hypoxic respiratory failure. You found this on the routine oxygen saturation test. Once you identify this and you realize that it is persistent, you, you provide initial oxygen supplementation uh, while you do your thorough assessment. You stabilize the airway, you know, make sure breathing and circulation are appropriate. You know, because again, things can go left very quick. So in as much as you're trying to, you know, give oxygen supplementation, you have to be very aware of what might be happening to the patient. For example, they're not able to protect their airway. No amount of oxygen you give them through nasal cannula is gonna really do them uh, uh, any, any good. Next, if the patient is stable enough on the initial oxygen supplementation, your next goal is figuring out why they are hypoxic in the first place, you know. Um, the chest x-ray will be the easiest place to start. You know, other imaging modalities such as the CT angiography or the uh, CT chest without contrast or with contrast should only be done if you've done the uh, chest x-ray first because that's always the first place uh, to begin, you know, to really gain clarity on the diagnosis that you're dealing with. An arterial blood gas is not, is, is not always needed, you know, if patient is responding to uh, the initial oxygen supplementation. So you don't always have to do it, especially when we're talking about hypoxic respiratory failure here. If patient is responding to giving them oxygen uh, uh, supplementation, uh, it's again, overuse of resource that may not necessarily change your management. Now let's go to some of the common uh, uh, differentials you must run through you know, uh, in your head while you're thinking about hypoxic respiratory failure, because that's again, what's gonna guide your treatment Remember I said you're addressing the, uh, the respiratory failure itself by providing some form of respiratory support, but then you're also addressing the underlying cause of the respiratory failure. So in this case, hypoxic respiratory failure. Remember we said it's typically an issue with uh, diffusion limitation, ventilation, perfusion mismatch. So you're thinking about pneumonia, for example, you know, because of the 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 the, the materials deposited in the alveola, you may not necessarily be able to get oxygen across that and then get into the system. Uh, you're also thinking about pulmonary edema, heart failure. This one, you know, you might be able to, you, it could cause hypoxic, it could cause hypercapnic as well, but you shouldn't be surprised if you're, if, if a patient has pulmonary edema and they have hypoxic respiratory failure. So pulmonary edema, like I mentioned, uh, pulmonary embolism um, uh, is also another cause. In this case, there is oxygen in alveoli, but there's not enough blood coming to that area to get the, the, the oxygen and deliver into the system. ARDS is one of the very common causes of respiratory failure. Uh, in fact, it will, it, it's, it's, first of all, it's a syndrome, 
Um, I, I, it's, it's, it's many different things that can lead to it. One of the more recent encounters we've had with ARDS would be, in, for example, in COVID patients where, you know, they initially started with like, you know, COVID pneumonitis and things just progressed to the bilateral diffuse patchy infiltrates and then oxygen delivery and oxygen uh, uh, um, uh, saturation is significantly impaired and in terrible respiratory failure, very, very, very serious situation uh, that you have to address. Pleural effusion will, will be another uh, example of a cause of hypoxia respiratory failure. Pneumothorax, you know, sites of the lungs collapse and you're not able to, that area of the lung that is collapsed is not, you're not able to participate, that part of the lung is not able to participate in, you know, uh, uh, gaseous exchange and, and, and then you have hypoxia respiratory failure. A very common cause of hypoxia respiratory failure uh, that could happen uh, would be, for example, atelectasis, you know, it doesn't necessarily cause very serious examples of it, but it's one of the differences that you definitely have to put in your in your mind while you're while you're uh, thinking about hypoxic respiratory failure. You know, most of the diagnoses that we've mentioned will be identifiable on the chest X-ray, for example. You know, except for things like pulmonary embolism, where you definitely have to do your CT angiography of the chest, you know, to be able to say for sure that they have uh, the disease. You know, so while you're managing your respiratory failure, you should, you know also be addressing uh, and managing the underlying cause. I, I can't say this enough because you're giving oxygen, you're giving all these respiratory support. If you're not fixing the underlying issue, you're not really going to get anywhere with your management. You know, So how exactly do we manage respiratory failure? Uh, uh, really, it's about an ex escalation process. It's, it's do one thing and doing the other thing and then doing depending on how the patient is improving, depending on the improvement of the clinical picture. You know, so again, the oxygen supplementation via nasal cannula is the first place to begin. You know, when we use, uh, ox um, uh, um, when we give oxygen supplementation via nasal cannula, the limits that we would normally be able to go to will be around six liters, because once you get there, you know, the, it's not, most of it is not humidified. The flow is a little bit too much for the nasal mucosa. It could dry it up and cause bleeding. And that's not something you want. So by the time you start to get to about five liters of the regular nasal oxygen, uh, nasal uh, cannula oxygen, you want to be thinking about other ways that you would uh, uh, provide oxygen supplementation. Now we have several different types. Once you go past the regular, you know, nasal cannula oxygen, you have several different things that you could do initially. One of them would be the non-rebreather mask. In, in some, you could have a venturi mask. Uh, uh, in this particular scenario, you could set the amount of oxygen that you're given or set the FiO2, fraction of inspired, fraction of inspired oxygen that you, you're given. Uh, uh, and then outside of these two things, in some facilities, you'd have almost like an adapted um, high flow oxygen where you can give more than the six liters. It's connected to the same oxygen supply that's on the wall next to the patient. And then you can have a humidifier attached to it. With that, because of that, that uh, the, 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 the device that's on the wall next to the patient can typically give about 15 liters, you won't be able to go more than 15 liters because, again, the respiratory failure could be as bad as you being you requiring you know, more than 15 liters. All of these things that I've mentioned, you can call them high-flow oxygen in a low-flow system. But again, it really, all of these terminologies don't really, don't really matter as much as you're escalating appropriately and you know the different things that you can do to help the patient. Number one, we said, starting with an, uh, oxygen, uh, oxygen uh, uh, supplementation via nasal cannula, uh, going to things like non-rebreather, the venturi mask, all the adapted you know, high flow if you have it in your facility. Um, beyond 15 liters for example the next thing you'll be able to do will be to go ahead and use the actual high flow nasal cannula oxygen uh, uh um uh, a device where you can go further than 15 liters now uh some some of some some of those machines will go to about 60 liters or even more in certain cases um this particular one the reason why you're able to go as high as that is the cannula is adapted for that capacity and it's a separate machine different from the one that's on the wall. Uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm sure I must have mentioned that it was humidified. Um, the thing about this is, even though it's coming at a very high pressure, it doesn't really do much with the work of breathing. So if you have a patient that's hypoxic, you know, that's requiring these escalated modes of oxygen supplementation 
you probably want to start thinking of other things. And by the way, these are the patients, by the time you're constantly escalating the oxygen supplementation, you definitely would have wanted to do the blood gas to see if there's another type of uh, respiratory failure that you should be addressing while you're doing this. And that brings us to the next spot. So we said nasal oxygen, the, the non-rebreather ventury mask or the adapted high flow, the actual high flow with that can go as high as 15, uh, more than 15 liters, up to about 60 liters in many cases. Beyond that, if you have a patient that's having, you know, increased work of breathing, you know, you're already doing your, your ABG to see if there is hypercapnia in this particular situation. But then you're thinking about, can we use a non-invasive uh, uh, mechanical ventilator? In this case, we'll call uh, the BiPAP as an example of that. You're not intubating the patient. We're not talking about indication of intubation. When we get there, we will talk about it. Is because the patient is requiring more oxygen supplementation, and now you have to provide uh, this oxygen supplementation for the patient. Um, so again, once you go past the high flow is going to kind of like if you're thinking the patient is kind of working to breathe, the BiPAP will be a reasonable uh, escalation. Now, intubating the patient and putting them on mechanical ventilation could have started from the beginning. Remember, I told you the moment you see that the patient is in respiratory failure, one of the things that you want to do is make sure you know assessing the the airway, the breathing, and circulation. If at that time you noticed you notice that the patient wasn't able to protect the airway, for example, it would be clear that you should have intubated the patient and then you know put them on a mechan mechanical ventilator and treat them with that. Um, so if you really think about intubation and mechanical ventilation, the two main indications would be, number one, you know, patients who's not able to maintain, uh, protect the airway, you can translate that also to, you know, Glasgow Coma scale of less than eight. You know, I'm not sure you'd be there doing all this. It's, it's a, you know, general clinical assessment that you have to make. Is this patient going to be able to protect the airway? If not, I'm most likely just going to intubate them and put them in a mechanical ventilator. Um, the other indication for intubation and mechanical ventilation would be uh, for patients that are uh, have failed all of these other respiratory support mechanisms, and then you don't have a choice, and really all that all that you have at that point is intubating the patient and putting them on uh, a mechanical ventilator. Um, you know, I always ask my students. Um, what is the end point of intervention when it comes to hypoxic respiratory failure? I think some of some some of you might know um, we had to use it in facilities that had it, it during COVID, and that would be the ECMO, the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Basically, just taking the patient's blood out of the body and doing the magic outside and putting it back in the in the body to to supply the vital organs. Um, it really is one of the last things you can really consider. When you're thinking about um, intervening and addressing uh, managing respiratory failure, uh, especially with hypoxic respiratory failure. And again, I cannot say enough. While you're doing all of these things, you want to have identified the cause of it and manage the cause appropriately. Uh, we'll move now to hypercapnic respiratory failure. Uh, in hypercapnic respiratory failure, the expectation is that you have made the diagnosis via an arterial blood gas. A partial pressure of CO2 will be higher than normal in these cases. Um, once you agree, once you identify that, the goal is to get the CO2 out. Uh, you know, and while, while like in hypoxic respiratory failure, you are addressing the underlying causes, in this case, you're also addressing the underlying causes of hypercapnic uh, respiratory failure. Uh, so some of the, some of the um, common uh, causes of hypercapnic hyper respiratory failure would be you know, COPD exacerbation, or obesity hyperventilation syndrome, um, an opioid overdose. Um, uh, like I said, pulmonary edema could also be um, a possible cause of um, hypercapnic crystal failure. So again, in terms of intervening here now, again, you address addressing the online issue, but you're also managing respiratory failure. In terms of intervening, really what you're thinking about is uh, the BiPAP straight away, because here you can you can set the uh, uh, positive airway pressure, whether the inspiratory and the expiratory, and you're able to allow them, you know, get the CO2 out more effectively. And again, because there's always an escalation game with respiratory failure, if you try that and you don't have any specific improvement, you have to go to the next thing. And typically what you would consider as BiPAP failure would be, you know, patients have been on the BiPAP for about three you know, three to four hours, some people say less, you know, I would say probably three hours on, on an average. If you're seeing that the, the uh, CO2 is getting worse, it's getting higher, 
or the patient's not getting better, you know, maybe they're getting more confused now and more more lethargic and sphalopathic, you have to think about the next thing. Obviously, in this case, it will be intubating the patient and putting them on the mechanical ventilation. The goal of mechanical ventilation, like it, it, whether it's the invasive or the non-invasive, is again, two things. Well, there's several ways you could do it. On the mechanical ventilator, you can set the respiratory rate, meaning the more they breathe, the better it is that they get the CO2 out. You can set the tidal volume, meaning the amount of oxygen, uh, the amount of air that goes in, basically gets us more, gets more CO2 out. So respiratory tidal volume. You can also do uh, the inspiratory respiratory um, uh, ratio that could also help get them in expiration a little bit longer, where they're able to blow out the CO2. Some of these things, I guess, you know, if you're just starting out, it might be difficult to understand. But if, if you're ever in a situation where a nurse called you and say, uh, or a respiratory therapist says, hey, doc, we did, you know, the ABG and CO2 was worse or CO2 is not getting better, one of the things you'd be able to do is to increase the respiratory rate or increase the tidal volume to get the CO2 out. Um, so having said all that, we'll go ahead and uh, apply it all of what we've said now to case scenarios and see if we can make out the answers. I'll see you in a little bit. All right, like we said, um, we'll go over uh, a case scenario, several case scenarios, just to be we're able to apply the things that we've learned so far. All right, so in this case, we have a 65-year-old female with history of hypertension and diabetes mellitus who was recently admitted to the hospital for acute kidney injury. She now presents with shortness of breath, uh, cough and confusion. Chest x-ray shows a left lower lobe pneumonia. Uh, the patient was found uh, with oxygen saturation of 83%. Uh, arterial blood gas findings are as below. So we have a pH of 7.34, PCO2 44, PO2 of 61, uh, bicarb of 19, and oxygen saturation of 82%. What is the diagnosis here? Um, based on what we said, you know, it's very clear. Oxygen saturation is low. We have a diagnosis, and she has uh, signs of respiratory failure as well. There we go. Acute hypoxia respiratory failure is the answer here. There's really not much to, to debate or expand on further based after having you know gone over all of the things that we've we've discussed. Uh, this is acute hypoxia respiratory failure. Notes here that we're saying acute because again, patient might have a, a history of chronic hypoxia. Chronic hypoxia respiratory failure. Really, what does that mean? Meaning they were dependent on oxygen supplementation from prior. Me from home, you know, they were put on oxygen supplementation and been using it. And if you have to make a diagnosis of, uh, for example, acute. Um, one second. One second. All right. If you have to make a diagnosis of acute respiratory failure here, uh, if a patient already has chronic Respiratory failure, meaning they were on oxygen at home. This would be the diagnosis, acute and chronic, all right? But here, they don't have that history, and it's clearly acute hypoxia respiratory failure. All right, next question. Patient's respiration did not improve uh, beyond 87% with four liters of oxygen, viennese, or cannula. There is no obvious use of accessory muscles. What is the best, what's the next best step? All right, so here, uh, we have, uh, you either do a non-rebreather mask or adapted high flow ventury mask and again these are all several options that most likely will yield the same result um, my preference in a facility that has it is if you can humidify the the air that comes from the wall connector uh and and go as high higher than six liters remember we said six liters kind of like the limit with the regular nasal cannula if you have the if you have a humidification adapted to that wall connector you can go higher than six liters, even up to 15 liters, and you know patients should still do okay. So th that that would be my preference as opposed to the non rebreather or the venture mask. It's just easy to use, you know, uh, from a practical point of view. Moving beyond that, um, patient continued to deteriorate on non rebreather mask now with obvious liquid breathing and use of accessory muscles. Uh, patient is still awake, alert, but not able to communicate in full sentences. The labored breathing, you know, they're using, doing a little bit more work. Now, the answer here is, um, um, you would definitely want to consider the BiPAP as your first option, you know, be, to help, to help with the work of breathing. Um, that would be your preference in, in most scenarios, but it is possible with the actual high flow nasal cannula device where you can go as high as, you know, 60 liters. 
it's, it is possible to still provide some positive airway ventilation with that device. But if you had to choose the non-invasive bi-level positive airway pressure, this is, you know, again, the BiPAP will be your preference here. Noted that I said that the patient is still awake and alert, meaning they're not at the point where you're worried that they will be able to protect their airway or not. So these are, uh, are mechanisms that you would use to help the patient move forward. And this is, again, part of that escalation process. Um, we have another scenario here, uh, a 59-year-old patient with a history of COPD and home oxygen, chronic smoking history, is presented in the hospital with one day history of worsening shortness of breath, cough and wheezing. Um, uh, patient also has tried to use the nebulizers at home without any improvement. Upon arrival to the ED, patient was not able to speak in full sentences, although oxygen saturation was 91% on his usual four liters of oxygen at home. A three block gas shows this. We have a pH of about 7.29, PCO2 of 75, PO2 of 65, um, uh, 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 bicarb 28, uh, oxygen saturation of 90%. What is the diagnosis here? All right. We have one diagnosis so far. So acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. All right, patient was on oxygen at home, wasn't on anything else at home other than oxygen. But to make this a little bit more complete, we can also say that they have chronic, right? Chronic hypoxic respiratory failure. Or to be more exact, because now we are having, nine, let's say the patient saturation saturating at around 90%, on their usual four liters of oxygen, maybe there's an acute component here, so it will be acute on chronic. I'm, I'm adding these things so you see how, how sometimes vague things can be in a clinical setting. You just have to really look deeper and understand what you need to put. And again, this, is, this goes beyond, it goes beyond just the medicine itself. It also goes to logistics, you know, being able to document properly and capture what you're really doing for the patient. Yes, clearly there is high, uh, hypercapnic respiratory failure. Clearly it is an acute hypercapnic respiratory failure, but there is a hypoxic component to it based on the chronicity of it, based on a chronic hypoxic respiratory failure. But if you had to judge based on the fact that they're still using the four liters, but they're saturated lower than 92%, you know, the, there's an argument that this is, in fact, in addition to the acute, acute hypercapnic respiratory failure, there's acute on chronic hypoxic respiratory failure there as well. All right, so what would you do next? With, again, we're dealing with acute hypercapnic respiratory failure as our main diagnosis. What would you do next? Next best step. There you go. Non-invasive bilevel positive air pressure uh, ventilation. Uh, the BiPAP. Again, our goal here is to try to get that CO2 out excrete, excrete the CO2, all right? And that's what we're using this. And obviously the patient is, is you know, working to breathe, but even though, if there weren't necessarily, the, the, the only way you'd be able to get the CO2 out would be through something like the BiPAP. The oxygen, oxygen supplementation won't necessarily change much in this particular situation. Is high flow, is high flow nasal cannula appropriate in this scenario? It, it definitely won't. You probably already saw the answer. Um, it won't, you know, again, like I said, the goal is to blow the CO2 out. The oxygen supplementation won't necessarily do much in that regard, all right? So the answer is no. Initial orders for this patient should include what? What are the things that you should worry about? Again, this goes back to into addressing the underlying problem. If you were to go back, you saw this patient has a serious of COPD, worsening shortness of breath, cough and wheezing. That should tell you what the likely underlying cause of their hypercapnic respiratory failure is. So you want to obviously get a chest x-ray, do the routine labs, make sure there are no other things causing this particular picture. In fact, could it be an MI? You know, could, could it be a heart failure? You really want to do that thoroughly before you go, at it. go ahead and you know, manage the, the, uh, the underlying thing. But beyond all of that, you have to address the COPD exacerbation because it's clear that that is what the case is here. IV glucocorticoids in a in a hospital setting, you could get away with oral as well. Uh, um, but again, if you're in a hospital, you might as well use IV. Why not? Um, there's there there hasn't been shown there had there's no clear uh, data to say that one is better than the other. 
But anecdotally, I think most people just use IV. Um, the bronchodilators will be important here. Protropium, you know, anti-muscarinic agent, um, uh, uh, the albuterol uh, will be very useful. Most of the time we use them in that mixture and try to do it uh, as needed and as and scheduled. As needed and scheduled. So bronchodilators as needed and scheduled. So you don't want a situation where you put the orders there and nobody's giving the patient the, the medication. You should definitely make sure that there's something that keeps going and if they need more, there is another order that would give them that supplemental bronchodilator therapy in the intervening periods. Um, antibiotic for atypical coverage, uh, if no evidence of pneumonia, especially in patients with respiratory failure requiring BiPAP and patients with thick and copious secretions. These, these are not, these are just things that suggest that there is likely a, an infectious trigger behind the COPD. So you should definitely cover for that. In fact, most people will tell you, you know what, I just give everybody with COPD exacerbation antibiotics because even if you don't see the infectious trigger, you probably, you know, it's probably there. And that's the reason why they're coming to the hospital this time. Um, another very important thing you should definitely have checked is, you know, rule out viral causes, you know. So you're checking for your COVID, you're checking for RSV, you're checking for uh, uh, flu, all right? Because again, you may not necessarily be able to do much with those scenarios, but it's important knowing, it's important for infection control, isolation and all of that stuff right so it's part of proper management treating the on making sure you rule out other possibilities and mi check doing chest x-ray and looking for pneumonia treating the underlying copd iv uh, uh, glucocorticoids in general bronchodilators antibiotics for the most part especially though in patients with uh, respiratory failure requiring bipap and patients with thick and copious secretions which could suggest that there is in fact an infectious etiology there um, and then finally, uh, 20 minutes after the patient was placed in BiPAP, he was found to be somnolent, barely unresponsive. What would you do now? You're worried about, ooh, is the patient able to protect the airway? What would you do at this time? There you go, endotracheal intubation, mechanical ventilation. And really, that's, that's most of, most of the, the consideration uh, that you would uh, make for hypercapnic respiratory failure. Um, I'm glad you, you hung out till the end here. It was very important that you did because again, it's not just about knowing the information, it's also about applying the information in case scenarios. I um, appreciate the time. I will see you in the next video. Bye.